great to be uh, part of your event here today and uh, I hope to be uh, along to many more. But that depends on how good a job I do today with these fine gentlemen to the left of me. Let me introduce them. Uh, we, uh, we have, uh, of course, the Minister uh, down the end. Welcome, Minister, again, and uh, Scott Hanson, Director General, New South Wales Department of Prime Ministries. You might just want to put your hand up, just in case people don't know you, Scott. Richard Bull, Chair of Local Land Services, and Matt Brand, uh, CEO, New South Wales Farmers, standing in for uh, Derek Scone, who's um, what, fogbound, sitting in a plane somewhere. Okay, well, um, all right. So I've been given my writing instructions here that. Uh, that the three of you uh, now need to give a response to the presentation. I hope you don't have PowerPoint slides. Um, if you could give a two minute, and we're on a pretty strict time, so uh, I will call you on it. So a two minute, uh, basically uh, a response to the, uh, to the Minister's presentation. Um, uh, Matt, I'm going to actually ask you to go first. Uh, it'd be nice if you could perhaps touch on the Minister's comments there about it being business as usual. I'm intrigued by that. Is it really business as usual? Yeah, look, I think, um, as the Minister said, he used language like uh, gearing up, and I think that, that certainly is the opportunity. I think for us, the reason we said business as usual is that there are some very big numbers in, in the budget, which is terrific, and it's, and it's looking very good. But as usual, it's always the devil in the detail, and I think for us, what we're really keen to do is to, um, to unpick that, climb in and, and again to the Minister's point, look at where government can play a role and where government can uh, step out of the way. And I think that, that's um, a, a great opportunity. I think we are very lucky in that we have um, an agency like DPI that it's actually put on paper and, and communica communicates widely um, its vision and how it wants to achieve that vision. I think that, that makes it a lot easier for an organisation like ourselves. Um, but I think for us, if you, if you had to sort of distill it down, I think there's some really, really good positives in there around the Young Farmer Business uh, Project program. That, that's something that we've, we're very excited to see about helping the next generation uh, come in and I think that that money will be very well uh, utilised um, across across the state. I think the, um, the reduction of stamp duty, I think that's a, a again that's a really good incentive to get people um, using business tools like insurance. I think that's a, a, a real positive. Um, and I think the I guess the other the other thing for us is the around LLS. I think LLS is a very important agency and we sort of see that they're very much dovetail into, into DPI and they have a very important role around the new biodiversity uh, reforms. And, and we're going to you know, watch, uh, watch with interest and, and work very closely with, with Richard and, and David at, at the LLS to, to ensure that um, the process that farmers go through, win, lose or draw in terms of what, what they want to do on their farm with, with the new reforms, we want to make sure that it is a, a, a transparent and a professional uh, process that they go through, and I think that's going to be really important. On the other side, I think there's um, some really good opportunities that we, we hope to um, work closely with government on, particularly around the infrastructure piece. I think there's some big opportunities with inland rail to make sure that we develop a plan around our infrastructure, so road, rail, ports, but it's going to be really important that we don't end up in a situation where uh, we have a whole lot of local councils potentially or towns starting to do their bidding to, uh, to try and tap into um, the inland rail. What we need to do is take that, I guess, holistic approach, a bit like what we've got in the, in the red book. And I think there's going to be some really good opportunities for us. And, and I think that'll be an opportunity missed if we don't do that work around looking at a, a plan for infrastructure. Because otherwise I think we could end up potentially putting a lot of uh, infrastructure like we've, we've seen on, on this side of the Great Dividing Range and, and the squeaky wheel and, and inner city votes and things which, which comes into play from time to time, particularly as we enter the silly season. So I think for us we want to make sure that regional New South Wales gets its fair share. Obviously there's a bonanza with the poles and wires, that, that additional money, we're really looking forward to seeing how we can uh, help enable, enable that, that spend. Uh, I think the biosecurity piece is probably one area that we really want to make sure that we see more money put in, into that. I mean, it is a point of difference. We talk about the fact that we are the world's largest island. Um, we have a whole lot of competitive advantage with our isolation, but it only takes one or two incidents and, and we could have some fairly significant impacts on, on our industry around biosecurity. So 
a little bit like we've seen with Crown Lands Reform, Biodiversity Reform, there are actually budget items there. Uh, for biosecurity, uh, there are elements where it's implied, but we're really looking forward to working with government to make sure that we, we carve out money out of that surplus to put behind uh, biosecurity, because that's going to be very important. And then I think there's also some big opportunities, um, again, digging into the numbers and, and developing a plan, you know, some simple projects. For, for example, there's a project that we've seen work very well in Victoria with dairy underpasses. We think that that's a no-brainer. We've got GPS coordinates of farms on the north and south coast, ribbon-ready projects, photographs and local papers. It'll be fantastic cutting those ribbons around those um, dairy underpasses. Um, so look forward to that. Um, and then I think also it's looking at um, the precincts around things like Badgerys Creek. If Badgerys Creek um, you know, gets up and running, I think there's some really good opportunities around precincts. Uh, and obviously connectivity in the bush is going to be important as well. So infrastructure, really important and a great opportunity, I think, with a surplus to ensure that we climb into the numbers and sort of move away from the T-shirt the, the or the, the, the tea towel slogan, as I like to call it. Um, the tea towels after the show, the Red Book, we turn into tea towels that you can then get big headlines. But for us, it's really the detail we want. We want the detail behind it, and I think that's something we're going to look forward to working with government on. Absolutely, and some of that detail, I'd love to hear from you, uh, Richard. I mean, obviously, you're one of the large beneficiaries of the uh, of the sweeteners that the government's been handing out on, on, on out of this budget. I mean, uh, you, and I guess your organisation's where the rubber hits the road in, in many respects. Where do you see the the priorities and where do you want to see some of this money get uh, spent and how will you be spending it? Well, thank you very much, uh, Brad. Look, uh, we're into our fourth year of operation. LLS is uh, a combination of, uh, of CMAs and LHPAs and Department of Agricultural Extension staff. And, uh, and we really are now, I think, hitting the road. Um, we're very pleased with the budget. Um, we had an, an increase in our our expenditure, our recurrent expenditure of almost $6 million, uh, which are going to go a long way to getting more services on the ground. Uh, we have identified a problem uh, in the peri-urban areas, uh, not only around uh, Sydney, but also in large regional centres where we have a lot of small landholders, uh, blockies, I think is the, the correct term or the, or the other term, and, and a number of those uh, do present uh, a threat to biosecurity, both in animal health, uh, weed infestation. Uh, so we're going to be having more extension officers out in the field, helping those people understand their responsibilities under, under those acts. Um, we're also uh, very pleased to have uh, more biosecurity um, uh, assistance in, in two key areas, in the Greater Sydney Basin, where um, the the Sydney Airport and obviously the docks present uh, a, a biggest risk for biosecurity in New South Wales and Australia for that matter. Uh, so uh, an extra uh, amount of funding is going in there. Also in the western areas where the, uh, the ratepayers are sparse and we are very keen to increase our biosecurity effort in that area. So it's been a really good budget for uh, LLS. Um, we're pleased to get this extra funding and our recurrent funding. Uh, we've got enough money to do the job and uh, $182 million is a lot of money. I'm not uh, going to try and unpack all the detail there, but uh, we are pleased the way things are unfolding and we are a very concerted organisation in delivering services on the ground. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, Scott Hanson, um, you know, it's a, it's a big... Bucket of money, isn't it? $1.3 billion, I think it is, for the, for the New South Wales regions and, and rural areas out of the, uh, out of the state budget. Um, obviously, looking for a bit of a return on that investment. Um, you know, does the primary production base have the capacity to be able to deliver back on that in terms of these goals that you've set for, uh, for 2030? Oh, thanks, Brad. Um, I think you see from the graphs that are up there what a combination of a decent season, some decent prices, and the enabling both technology and market access that's been invested in over the previous decades, you know, the kind of return that primary industries can turn around in such a short period of time, I mean, I think it's just phenomenal. For us, the budget actually provides two filters that we need to look at. The first filter is how do we keep doing the work we need to do to enable people to capitalise on good prices, good seasons, to make the most out of what they can harvest now? But equally, what do we need to be planting? What do we need to be starting? What do we need to 
be investing in now that will be 10 years' time producing the opportunities and the step changes for industries, individuals, communities to be able to, again, either seize on an opportunity to grow the value of their business, their community, their industry, or to offset or, or manage a risk that may arise. So we, we view the budget largely through the lens of what else can we be doing right now to both protect and enhance the return on the investment for our stakeholders and prime industries, and what do we need to be investing in now to set up prime industries for the next decade? Because you know, a lot of the benefits we see today are actually things that have been invested in by our forebears or those who come before us to actually give us the platforms to be able to do this. And, and look, and, and Scott, I haven't, uh, and this is a really a question for the whole panel as well, I haven't gone through the little red book there in, in a lot of detail. But one of the things I'm not really seeing, and I might have missed it, I'm happy to be corrected on it, um, is about, you know, I mean, a power. I mean, I talk to farmers, they talk to me about, you know, affordable uh, electricity to be able to run their businesses. Is I mean, if, if we're going to be uh, throwing a lot of money uh, at... Uh, at the primary producer base in New South Wales, is is that critical issue uh, going to be addressed in, in that way? Otherwise, uh, a lot of this is just uh, for naught, really, isn't it? Uh, well, it won't be for naught. It'll just be a harder slog to get up that hill if you keep increasing input costs, right? Um, and we we certainly see it as a a major risk, and that's why we're partnering up with industry groups who have got some expertise, got some thoughts and got some views. I mean, we see that there's both a, a, a series of steps that starts with how do we make sure we're most efficiently using available power now to minimise those input costs or to make the most out of the inputs that you put into your business. Secondly, what new technologies are available to either reduce your reliance um, or stretch further uh, the renewable opportunities that you might have in primary industries. And out of that then comes an interesting series of questions about policy and regulations, however. You know, we've seen in irrigation industries what happens if you have multiple farms hop off a distributed network, leaving one or two farms to carry the burden of infrastructure costs, and we need to make sure we don't set ourselves up in a way in which we end up with few farms carrying the burden of huge infrastructure costs going forward with regards to energy. But we by no means are the experts in this field, so we work across other government agencies. Importantly, we work with organisations like Irrigators Council, with New South Wales Farmers, um, to, to look at this in more detail and from a practical point of view in terms of what we can help on the ground now with and what we can set up for the future. And, I, and, then, and I'm interested to hear about what it is that farmers and, and people who are living in rural and regional areas are telling you and what perhaps what consultation was had with those areas in the preparation of, the, of, of this money going out. I, I just wanted to come back to you, Matt, before I have a question for you, Minister. I don't want you to think that you're getting off the hook here lightly. Um, just to quote uh, your, uh, your president, Matt, who's uh, currently sitting on a plane somewhere in Albury, um, and just to expand on the business as usual headline, because there was probably a bit more to that, and I, I'll, I'll quote some of what Derek had to say here. He says, we understand that the government is probably keeping its powder dry before next year's pre-election budget. Nevertheless, we will continue to keep the pressure up on all of the issues that matter to primary producers. Now, them fighting words, but I'd like to know what pressure, how are you going to keep that pressure up, and what exactly are the issues? that matter to primary producers in, in, in the context of this budget? Yeah, look, um, we, we've actually got a, a, a list of uh, opportunities we, we um, have been, I guess, discussing with government. I guess with the change change of leadership in the, in the government, uh, we then started again and went around and, and consulted with uh, key, key ministerial officers and, and departments. Um, to, to Scott's point, uh, one of the major constraints is around input costs, so that's an area that we're really focusing on. Uh, we've got a project that we've identified a number of sort of precincts around uh, New South Wales where we believe if we could provide um, innovative solutions for um, energy would, would be uh, very much worth worth doing. Exploring, you know, microgrids, getting people off off main um, main networks, etc. Looking at um, alternatives to a lot of people have switched back to dirty old diesel for, for irrigation um, pumps. What we need to do is look at some other other alternatives. So we, we have got a long a long list, um, and what we want to do is um, 
keep exploring that with government and, and hope that uh, as we get closer to the, uh, the silly season that we can capitalise on that and, um, and, and bring home some real benefits to, um, additional benefits to, to uh, New, New South Wales. Thanks, Matt. Uh, one last question from me to the Minister before we go to the floor for some questions. I hope that you're, you're primed out there and ready to throw some questions into the panel before we uh, wrap up at about uh, at about 10.2. I mean, Minister, um, yeah, budgets uh, might be about numbers, but they're also about politics as well, and there is uh, obviously a, a lot of money being spent, some good headlines for you here at the moment. Um, hasn't been an easy time, though, for the Coalition Government, and, and perhaps there's also trouble ahead with, um, you know, I just saw the, um, the cover story uh, uh, from the land two weeks ago about uh, you know the expected backlash out there in the Pilliger as well with uh, fears of pipelines and CSG wells etc. Is this just a bit of a uh, bit of a sugar-coated bulwark against some sort of a backlash that you might be anticipating out there in the in the rural heartland as you lead into a new election? I think uh, I think what we've delivered, particularly uh, for regional New South Wales, is is what was expected. Um, everyone in New South Wales expects their fair share and, and I think that this budget has a strong regional flavour because that's what uh, we were hearing as we travel around. Uh, the beauty about my job is I get plenty of free advice. Um, so we, um, we certainly shouldn't be left wondering what people are thinking because uh, particularly in the primary industry sector, uh, people tell you exactly what they're thinking and what we should be doing differently. I think the other, the other thing I'll say about the budget, and particularly as it relates to primary industries, is this is the first budget that I've been involved in as a member of ERC. So I now know how treasurers think. And very lucky that we have a treasurer through this budget that was willing to support the sector but also regional communities. But what scares me the most is what an alternate way of thinking may do. And I don't want primary industries to become the low-hanging fruit for any treasurer of the future. And that's when you see what we've delivered for the budget, a lot of collaboration and cooperation and shared partnerships, whether it's with New South Wales Farmers or GRDC. We're trying to government-proof the sector as much as possible. And Rick might say that it, it's welcome with an increased um, government allocation to LLS, but that doesn't excuse them for working as hard as they can to not be a burden back on government. Because what I do know is if someone else is in my chair and the Treasurer's chair in the future, and they start looking around for low-hanging fruit, if there's no one in that room that's standing up for primary industries, if there's no one in that room that's from a regional community, if there's no one in that room that actually has worked and lives and relies upon this sector, it just becomes what, what we, we saw in years gone by. One of the reasons I got involved in uh, politics was because I marched uh, at the time at the potential closure of a, re closure of a research station um, in the Riverina. Now we're starting to look at how we take uh, the sector as far away from Macquarie Street as possible so it doesn't live and die on budget day. And we do that by the way that we've been able to construct and allocate this. So is it about, uh, about politics? I'd like to think it's more about government proofing the sector to be resilient of the politics of the future. Thank you, Minister. So now it's over to you. We've got, uh, I think, a roving... Uh, ben, is that right? Is this the roving mic that we're using for questions, yeah. or is there another one there? Oh, we would. Uh, it'd be great if you could use the microphone when you ask your question, just because we're live streaming today's panel discussion as well out through uh, the Land's Facebook page. I'd like to acknowledge Alex Drews here from the Land, doing uh, hard work there. Of course, live streaming it out today and, and writing a report on today's lunch as well. So you can see it all at theland.com.au. So who would like to ask the first question? Um, if I see a hand, if the microphone will go to you. Otherwise, I'll just keep asking questions. I'm sure there's some DPI or, or ministerial staff that I gave those questions to that can... <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. No, perhaps... Perhaps not. All right. So, look, if there's no, if there's no further questions, we were um, a bit like, the, bit like the plane I was on this morning when the pilots say we, we're going to make up time. So we've just made up time. So I think uh, if there's no other further questions, we will probably leave the panel discussion there because I was meant to finish at about quarter two anyway, so um, I think uh, I think we're, we can we can keep going. We'll keep going then. All right. Well, let's uh, let me just refer back to my notes here. You've caught me on the. I was looking. I was looking for an early finish. All right. 
Yeah, you've got one, Alex. Go yeah. for it, mate. It's, Sorry, it's a, just a, you'll need the microphone, Alex, so that your own live stream can hear you. Cool. Uh, one for the Minister. Um, just sort of looking at the budget, uh, getting some feedback from different people. Uh, some, some, I guess, concerns that uh, there's a little bit of repackaging, I guess, claims of repackaging some of the funding, the, the billion dollar water announcement being one. Great to see uh, a lot of money going into regional water. Um, 500 million of that I, I did see was for the Broken Hill Pipeline. Um, I was wondering if you could unpack that a little, um, you know, how, how does that, is it 500 million, a billion, or, you know, how, how do you sell that to, to people going forward? Thanks, Alex. It's a uh, it's a billion dollar water fund. We've uh, we've got uh, we're out to market at the moment to look at the building of the Broken Hill uh, pipeline from from the Murray River. Uh, there's estimates around what that will cost, but uh, anything under those estimates continues to stay in that fund. So uh, that will be the largest spend on a uh, water infrastructure project for a regional community in the in the history uh, of, of New South Wales by a New South Wales government. And then we'll use the rest of the funds, uh, whatever's left over there, plus the other $500 million to, to build any other projects in regional New South Wales. So I'm always intrigued when people uh, are saying, well, what is it, uh, a billion or 500 million? Well, I think they're both pretty good numbers um, and, uh, and they'll go a long way. When you look at the Ardlethan uh, wastewater treatment plant costs $3.3 million. That's, that's something that is being funded um, by the government. And when you look at how many villages or towns like Ardlethan uh, can then get uh, a spending on the infrastructure like this, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good news. So. Um, we'll get on and, and do Broken Hill and we'll also open up uh, for any other communities that need this, uh, this money spent in there. So a billion dollars, not just a billion dollars though uh, that people are talking about, a billion dollars in black and white in the budget. So it's, it's money that's there to be drawn down on and spent. Thank Thanks Alex for your question. Is there any other, any other questions at all? I'm looking around the room, even behind the post there, down there in the cheap seats. No, no questions at all down there? Okay. We've got a question here at the front. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. If, you could, if you could stand up and, and ask your question and, and uh, say where you're from too, just for the benefit of our massive audience at home. Watching the live stream. <laughs> thank you. It's Craig Herity from PwC. Um, to the panel, no one in particular. Um, so congratulations to the DPI on the red book. That's fantastic and very insightful and um, uh, great data sets. But I guess my question is a little bit beyond that, which is how, how well do you think we really understand now, particularly in light of the comment around 10 years time, um, how well do we understand New South Wales, the true highest and best use of our land? So when you look at the production, the GVP in those documents, we are long grain, beef, wool, and everything else is relatively small. So when you look at the way markets are going internationally around consumption and different trends, um, is the highest and best use of our land being invested in today around what it will be in 10 years' time? Craig, I, I think that's a, a fantastic question. I'll, I'll very quickly kick off and, and say that um, uh, probably a bit of a plug for one area that I think New South Wales is really starting to pick up a bit of momentum is in aquaculture. Um, and, uh, and that is an area that traditionally, although we've had strong oyster industries, but we've never really uh, done a lot in the, the fish farming uh, side of things. There's a lot of uh, strong private enterprises particularly in the Riverina when we look at the Murray Cod. But New South Wales DPI um, have now got a, a trial that's exceeding our expectations um, off Port Stephens. Now that's not land based, but I think it, it is certainly part of uh, how we best look at um, food and fibre production systems that may be a better return on against land value, um, which may also buck some of the, the traditional trends. And uh, the thing about whether it's a horticulture slash hydroponics uh, aquaculture um, enterprise, you don't really need to look at the, the quality of some of those lands to look at those sort of production systems. So I'll just start very quickly by that to say I think we are thinking a little bit differently in New South Wales 
uh, at how we can meet some of those challenges of supplying protein to uh, to the markets that are that are thirsty and hungry um, on, on our doorstep. Uh, comment from you, Scott, as well. Or? Yeah, thanks. Um, a, a great, great question, and the great thing for us is we've got about 45,000 very independent entrepreneurs in the state who call themselves primary producers, who are probably best placed to keep pushing us in terms of what they think the best return on capital for is, not only their natural capital, but their actual financial and human resource <coughs> capital. And that swings wildly every year depending on how much water is available. Uh, what the season's like and, to be honest, what global supplies are like. I mean, you know, we're probably seeing in our two biggest commodities at the moment fantastic results for completely opposite reasons. So in our livestock sector, we're seeing strong global demand and a, sh a supply that's still suffering the impacts of the drought. Um, so we've got tight supply into a big demand, which is driving prices. On the flip side, on um, in grains, we've probably had as good a season, good a yield as we've ever had, but globally it's been a fantastic year for yield, which has brought prices down. Um, we, we see enormous opportunity. I mean, Pulses has been one of the standout successes in this um, the last two years. Um, you know, I, I think when you look across the board, we continue to see farmers not only look for what is the best return for them in their investment, but also what's the best mix to minimise risk and what's the best fit for both their family, their community and what their ambitions are. And, you know, good seasons with good prices. I mean, I, I don't see the fundamentals of a growing world population with more consumers being able to purchase higher value products, which lends Australia's sales pitch about our clean green product, our proteins, our, our wheat. Um, I see that continuing to go forward. I mean, if, if, if Tim McRae was in the room, our, our head economist, he'd caution me and tell me just about every 10 years we have a big global shock and we're just about due for a big global shock and it doesn't take much looking around the globe to work out what might cause some big global shocks at the moment. <laughs> um, but you know, the way it lines up, you know, we're, we're so ideally placed and I think you're starting to see investment flow from the private sector into our industries because everyone sees we're so ideally placed to capture these mega trends. Before we, we wrap it up, um, I assume there's, there aren't too many other questions coming from the floor. Maybe some final comments from Richard and from Matt, just maybe on a, a bit of a scorecard or a bit of an appraisal on how the government is tracking towards its uh, goal of increasing farm sector value by 30% by 2030. Uh, Matt, how do you think they're travelling on that uh, on that front? Well, as, as you saw in that graph, I think they're, they're travelling well. I think, just to go back to that question, I think there's going to be also quite large opportunities in horticulture. I think that's going to be another um, area, partic particularly in protective cropping. Also, if we get the precincts right, we can then be uh, processing or, or, or cutting vegetables out or pulling them out of the ground and then sticking them onto a onto a plane and into a market that, that very night. You know, they're, they're huge opportunities. I think in terms of, um, we're, on, we're certainly on track and I think, as I said at the Could beginning... Could we exceed it? Could we exceed 30%? I, I, yes, I think we can. I think, but it's going to be really looking at um, driving, I guess, margin maximisation and that's going to be where we're going to need to put a lot of emphasis on input costs and working out ways of using innovation and connectivity to help um, enhance farmers to make op optimal decisions around their inputs um, and obviously the energy uh, issue is something that we're really going to focus on. Terrific. And, and Richard? Well, I guess uh, <coughs> this discussion could have been held 30 years ago and the same question would have been posed by a government that we're going to increase productivity because we need to feed the world. And uh, we've always managed to get to those increases, to get to those levels of productivity. And uh, I'm a practising farmer uh, in lamb, so lamb is another one of those commodities that's doing very nicely, uh, huge growth and uh, huge growth potential overseas. So uh, there's all sorts of ways that new technology, new initiatives, entrepreneurialship, uh, all of those things uh, will drive and uh, certainly inform uh, that increase that we're looking for. LLS has a place to play. Um, 
we're all about adoption of new technology on the ground. Uh, we've got people out there talking to farmers, assisting farmers, working with industry, uh, working with private stakeholders to ensure that we get adoption of new practices, new technology and all of those things that are going to increase productivity, increase farmer man, uh, margins and to make life a little bit better. Uh, just on the Biodiversity Act, uh, for once uh, farmers in New South Wales from next Monday and certainly by the 25th of August will have the opportunity to sit down with uh, their LLS biodiversity officers and uh, look at new farm plans which will enhance their production, uh, will enhance uh, uh, whatever biodiversity outcomes are reached uh, for a win-win situation and for far too long. The farming sector in New South Wales has been hamstrung by certain acts and regulations which have not allowed them to, uh, to prosper and to expand, so hopefully we've overcome that too. Thanks very much, Richard, and thank you, gentlemen. It's been an enthralling conversation here this afternoon. I had a whole page of probing, hard-hitting questions I was going to hit you with, but uh, I don't have time, so I'm going to give those to Alex instead, and he can uh, follow up with you uh, through the week on those. So uh, thanks again for your time. Thanks, uh, thanks our, our, to our panel.